I'm not sure I had a goal. All I knew was I want to do what I want, when I want, for everybody who wants it. And I didn't think it would turn into shows four or five nights a week. It is a pleasure to be here at the Cog Factory in Omaha, Nebraska with all you guys and gals. So what was the cog factory? A dump. <laughs> the dirtiest shithole place you'd ever seen in your life. Big concrete hole filled with tetanus. <laughs> it felt like you were going to die. There was likely disease in the water. I swear it was just held together by cockroaches. Shredded posters or some sort of project that's being done to the ceiling. Crusty, messed up couches along the back wall. Really crude but functional. It was blistering hot in the summer and cold as hell in the winter. You know, the sticky floors, the smell. Frankly, I always wish the sound was better. <laughs> when you describe it, it sounds really terrible all around. Um, but it wasn't. It was a dump, but it was our dump. It's this dirty ass room. There's the fucking toilets don't work. There's stickers on the walls. You leave and there's this goo on your shoes that you can't get off. And you actually have to scrub it off with a brush. And we used to call it cog goo. Cog goo, remember cog goo? Cog goo, cog goo? On yeah. your hands. It, it would get everywhere. everywhere. Oh. No All one knows what it was either. Man. It, it was It was like a it combination was... of like vaporized sweat that then like re- it was, it, was, it was concentrated punk rock. <laughs> it was on the walls, on the floors. You'd be winding up the mic cables at the end of the night and you'd have a black line of filth. It's just, oh, yeah. it's horrible. It was the definition of DIY, punk rock, hardcore venue. Like it, I don't know how we didn't get sued, honestly. <laughs> like how nobody died. I mean, I don't understand how we got away with what we got away with for so long. And the funny part was like back in the day, we're like, man, why is the city and the cops, why are they being such assholes? And like looking back, I'm like, I wouldn't let my kids go there. Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know, like it's sharp metal and two assholes built the stage, you know, and like they've got this little tree house where they put the sound booth and the silence of the lambs bathroom, you know, like full of gore and feces. And uh, Rob had welded like motorcycle parts into some of the most dangerous like furniture that you could possibly imagine. It was the least kid-friendly place on the planet. How do you not get sued? <laughs> yeah, I, I go probably because I'm not an asshole. <laughs> Started getting the ball rolling in 92. Started getting it going. Uh, long story short, start with a budget, right? Which is an interesting thing that I actually had the smarts to do that when I was <laughs> 19, but money's money. That money came from, I mean, I pilfered my student loan and grant money. I mean, it was all college, you know, my, my scholarship money all went into that. That's how I paid for it all. I want the place to have the right feel and the right look. Not that I looked for a place that was really gross and dirty, but you know, <laughs> just trying to have a place that uh, gave off the right vibe. Definitely try to keep it downtown. You know, great, great high ceilings, a little off the radar. Ideally, we wouldn't have been where we ended up, but that's just how it worked out. Oh man, great part of town. Did a lot of good. 
I think I gave several dollars to people who had just run out of gas uh, and just needed to get back to their hotel. Um, the neighborhood, you know, prostitution every night right there on that corner, 22nd Leavenworth, which we proudly displaced just because of, you, you throw 100 kids out on the sidewalk three nights a week, they're going somewhere else because guys rolling by picking up prostitutes or they're not they don't want three <laughs> a bunch of high school kids watching them do it which I, my favorite uh memory as far as like the the area around there and the people was uh once i had it remember the, i think you were there with me and like this guy just comes up with this like like this jacket on this big old jacket he's like Hey guys, you need anything? I got crack oh, and yeah, yeah, crank. Yeah. Yeah, I, was that, just like, I was like, no man, we're good. I don't know, it was very comfortable. Even if, even though it was in like the cruddiest neighborhood, it was like, I think it was our place. We ran it. We took care of it. It felt all right to take it on. Like it felt all right to be responsible, but you were sort of, you know, still pretty lawless. If I, if I had to sum up those early experiences, it was that I'm not sure I had a goal. All I knew was, I, I want to do what I want, when I want, for everybody who wants it, you know. And, um, and the only way to do that is just to have your own space. It took, a, it took over a year to get that thing really off the ground. I actually did go down to the city, and I, I remember having a really difficult time describing what it is that I was doing to people at the city, and them having a dip, difficult time understanding what, I was talking about and, um, and I think that's to my fault like I couldn't I couldn't really put it in words because if you went to the city now and said hey, I'm gonna start an all-ages music venue like oh okay yeah but back then, <laughs> back then the people I was talking about like so it's a bar no it's not a bar it's a music club that's not a bar yeah how do you you know it was very I, I think it was a real surprise to a lot of uh, city people that I was talking to that there was bands that existed in the world that would play and not get paid the, it was interesting it, I, it was a real eye-opener to learn that people honestly thought that that didn't exist because to them a band is you go to the you go to the fair and see 38 special and that's a band right <laughs> and so and the only bands in the world are the ones you hear on the radio i mean it was it, it was really interesting it was a real interesting experiment to see how much people older people at the time didn't know which was i don't know if it's ironic or not but it was it was motivating like, wow, this may, this is more underground than I thought, you know? It's actually made it cooler. Like, jeez, I thought you kind of knew everything we did. You have no idea. So, what, uh... what, 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 what did the time before internet look like? I can't believe anything ever got done. <laughs> you know, but yeah, it apparently it did. A friend of ours, you know, pretty um, techie internet guy, it's like, I'll, I'll make you a Cog Factory website. I'm like, what the, what the fuck is a website? I mean, no idea. It's not necessarily pre-internet, but it's definitely the early, early, early stages. This is pre-MySpace, pre obviously pre-Facebook, pre-cell phone. And I was touring in bands at the time. And just thinking back to the difference of like, Screw the internet. Just thinking back to a time where there were no cell phones. You know, like we, we would like get off the road in a minivan and get on a, to, you know, a toll booth and call the club and be like, all right, I just got off on this interstate, you know, like ramp, where am I? And they're like, oh no, go get back on and go down two more. Then you're gonna take a left and there's a broken tree and you'll see this bar that burned down. You know, and like, and when you get to the pregnant homeless chick, you're there, you know, <laughs> like whatever. There was this secret underground network of like phone numbers that everyone had and they weren't cell phones, they were home phone numbers for these people and that's how you book tours. It was all phone calls. We had an answering machine at Rob's house that people would call and be like, hey, this is so-and-so from Brutal Juice in Texas and uh, we're rolling through there. We heard you've got a shithole we can play in. And we'd be like, yeah, you know, we'd like call them and be like, all right, we'll have our guy send the contract stuff. And be like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> No, <laughs> like, uh, that's if you want to play, you can play, you know, but like, we're not going to sign anything. We're not going to do anything. <laughs> and as far as like how people got to know where Cog, I mean, I didn't have an email address until Rob made me use, I had never used the internet either until Rob was like, this is how you use the internet. 
most people had email and we had an email list that people could sign up for. And I thought that was just revolutionary. I mean, email, I just couldn't even believe how efficient that was. It was blowing my mind. We had a thousand people on our email list. I feel like it was sort of the sort of the last frontier of, I don't want to say last frontier of DIY, but like really, you really had to work for it. I mean, uh, flyering, making flyers. People flyered the shit out of shows. You had to make flyers and you had to make interesting flyers. In order to do a show, you had to flyer it. You know, you had to get out there and, you know, photocopy flyers, you know, make hundreds of copies at, Z at Kinko's and put them up all over schools and hand them out everywhere at downtown, you know. You made sure you put them everywhere. You put them at Drastic, you would put them at an Aquarium, you put them at Homer's and you try to put them wherever they'd let you. The Cog Factory did a, a flyer and it was a schedule, you know, and it just did like a whole, it was like, a, I think it was just like a month. Total DIY, you know, there was no internet to go onto a chat room and say, hey, we're playing a show tonight, you know. Get all your friends, come down. It, there was none of that, you know? Mm -hmm. There's flyers everywhere. I, I think bands today still have to work it uh, pretty hard to get uh, get the, the word out about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I think the tools that they have are a little bit more uh, far-reaching uh, in that regard and, and, and a lot more immediate. Like, in a way, the Internet has made putting on shows ten times more difficult. I mean, you have you have easier access to everybody. Like, I, instead of instead of having to go go tell tell you know my friends and hand out flyers on the corner and, and stuff and, and really hustle, I can just go. I can do it from my phone. I can just make a, an event page and invite a bunch of people and boom. And then they, and then they, and they can, don't and show then they up. Can, like, not look at it. <laughs> They're just like going <laughs> cool. You don't have to go to a show to to hear new music, you know? I, I can sit there and go down a rabbit hole on YouTube of whatever type of music I want to, and then I'm like, okay, cool. You know, whereas back then, that's how we got exposed to new music, was we'd show up to a show, be like, oh man, those guys are rad, and, and then we'd buy their CD there, and then we wouldn't see them again for like three years. Yeah. So a few things. Shows that I remember, I remember them because amazing music, amazing presence, and amazing personality. The personality part was a was a great was a great test of a band because the place was so unforgiving. It was unforgiving in the sense of the sound quality. It was unforgiving in the sense of the cleanliness of the facility, you know, like they can look beyond the veneer of, of the space itself and its shortcomings, just like see the club for what it is, which was its personality and its intent, right? When a band shows up and they're, and say they've been to a bar where they're gonna get to drink, where they're gonna get food, they're making three times as much money, there's a clean place for them to hang out. Like, as I get older, I realize how important that is to bands. <laughs> Back then, I could, didn't give a shit. No uh, guarantee, you know, you get a percentage of the door, no food, <laughs> no anything. You just, you just, but it worked because, you know, another, a lot of times there was no other place to play between, you know, Chicago and Denver, stuff like that. There's just a, uh, it actually worked pretty well for the, for the bands, too. Uh, we're very live from Buffalo. A band like us, I grew up in Buffalo, and you know, there's a lot of scenes, and Chicago was easy, Detroit was easy, but when you start thinking about Omaha, you're like, whoa, is there actually like, to get from here to there, which is, you know, the Midwest, is there really a place to go, and then you show up, and people really take care of you, and we'd always have a good show, and it was, 
was done the way it should have been done. I have a lot of favorite shows. Uh, one of my favorite all-time favorite shows was Brainiac at the Cog Factory. Brainiac. 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 It was in the middle of summer. It was just packed. And it was hot. I mean, it was really hot. Super creative, very talented, and like the energy. Just insane. It, it, it was so out of time with what was happening in the world. A Dylan Jerk Skate Plan show was absolutely amazing. <laughs> We blew all the fuses. Anybody know a fuse box? Now you have the perfect opportunity to reach to your bottom right and squeeze your neighbor's ass cheek. Standing up front, that was the first time I'd ever seen Dillinger and just flying guitars all over the place and the power going out. And as technical as that band was, when they got the power back on, picked up exactly where they left off. And I was just like, oh my god. Poison the well. AFI played the Cog Factory quite a few times. Of course, AFI with the lines like wrapped down the street and around the corner and having to turn people away. AFI was a really cool show and they were really down to earth guys. The Q and Not You show was amazing. The cover of the record that they were touring on at the time was like decorated with balloons and streamers and stuff. And we decorated the stage that same way. And then they played and it was just, it was awesome. Crash Worship, amazing show. I think only because the it went on too long and the cops came and everybody was naked. Uh, Barangetti. And I remember just seeing, I was a short guy, still am. And I was standing on one of those things and I literally could only see the tops of heads and then guitar headstocks flying like everywhere and then I'd see the whole crowd disperse really quick and then I'd see a body fly through and it usually had a guitar on it mm -hmm. and I was just thinking to myself this is the first band like what's gonna happen after this? Well the very first time that I played with the Fonzarelli sticks out to me a lot. It was cool because I always loved those guys you know like Thad and Keith and Kyle and you know, just became really good friends with them over you know the course of you know playing at the Cog and just kind of hanging out there. And when then by the time we played that show, I mean it was really cool because it was just like wall to wall people, and it was just really something special. And uh, yeah, I'll never forget that one. That was a super super fun experience for sure. We had elevated the Cog Factory into this like mecca. Of, oh, yeah. of Omaha music like like we we thought we had made it like when we were playing the cog factory because like we'd heard all these great things we knew rancid had played there like you know like we thought it was like the greatest greatest thing in the world you know? explosions last show That show kind of embodied everything that the Cog Factory was about because it was just friends coming together and playing music just for the sake of playing music and being with each other. And they had all their friends' bands play the show also. So it's just like, you know, a big community of friends just coming together and celebrating the history that was Plosion and like just the history that is those friendships and that music. Anytime Turmoil came through was amazing. The last time they played was the Indecision, it was a ridiculous show. It was a, you know, on a Saturday night in January. It was freezing out and people were just going off. It was great. You know, we kept coming back. Every time we came on tour, uh, we'd play here and play the COG. And um, it just kept getting better and better. You know, I, a handful of times we played on the floor um, and that was always fun, energetic, and exciting. And uh, 
the last show that we played there, uh, we, we actually had to play on the stage because there's so many people there. <laughs> That place was packed, and I just remember the energy, man. Like, it, it was really cool vibe at that show, and um, I just had a great, amazing time. It was a really cool place, man, and we always had a great time there. Um, it's funny when you go and see other venues, you know, or spaces, that, you know, there, we did a lot of house shows and things like that, and. You know, it was always about the energy and the people in the room, you know, it, it, that's, I don't know. I mean, that's why I started playing music, you know, um, but the cog just naturally had that vibe. It was so cool, you know, and uh, it was funny, man. You'd see all different kinds of people. That was the other cool thing about the cog factory. It wasn't just hardcore kids. It was punk kids, ska kids. It, it was a whole diverse, you know, uh, genre of people. And. It was, it was really, really cool to see that. And we loved that. Like, even when we would play back in Pennsylvania, we would uh, pick our friends' bands, like punk bands and ska bands, and have a, this huge mixture of, of people and bands playing. It was just always good, you know? So it was always, it was cool to see that naturally happen. Like, you didn't really have to force it uh, at the cog, you know? There's dozens of favorite shows, but not a single one of them can I remember what bands were playing because the reason it's my favorite show is because, you know, I, I was in the back with my friends or out playing Foursquare or like eating hot dogs, grilling on the front because the community, the friendship is what I really, what, what I took from the COG. It was such a strong community, and that's what was great. It was you know the people that worked there and the people that went there. There was a mutual respect, you know, and, it, and like it's funny to say that people worked there because nobody was getting paid. <laughs> you know, it wasn't a job. I mean, I had a full-time job. Everybody that worked there had jobs, and we would go and work all day, and then we would go back there. We had so many volunteers there that would come in on their own, you know, clean up for us, book shows, you know, promote shows, um, you know, work the door, uh, work the sound. Because that, that place was much more than just a venue for bands to play music at. I mean, like I said, it was just a community of friends. And I never, I don't think I ever went to a show there, whether it be a hardcore show, an indie show, a ska show, whatever, where I felt uncomfortable or out of place. I mean, it was always just, it always felt comfortable. It always felt like, it felt like home. I met my best friends there. People who I didn't know became my best friends, and uh, if it wasn't for that place, I, there's, I would know half the people that I know now. I wouldn't have the passion that I have for music. That was our place, that was our hub, that was uh, where punk rock came from in Omaha. A lot of it had to do with just my friends. I mean, some of the best shows I was at was just my friends' bands, and I, I, it was the community. It was sort of a celebration of that and the ability to do something like that. Cock Factory is the greatest place in the world for me when I was mm -hmm. younger. There wasn't money to be made there. There wasn't greed. There wasn't, you know, corporations involved. It was just pure kids having fun, making music the way they wanted to make music, not caring what anybody else thought. They just wanted to do it their own way. Well, the, the Cog Factory is uh, the definition of freedom uh, for the Omaha music scene uh, to me. When the Cog Factory came, it felt like it was ours. It was anything we wanted to do, we could do at the Cog Factory. It made you feel like, like you were in a real band and you were a part of something that was going on. It helped me grow into not procrastinating on things. It, it made me learn, like, if you want something done, you can do it. You just got to do it. What was really great about it, you know, at the time was that you kind of had to learn how to adjust your sound on a stage. You know, you go play any other club, somebody's essentially doing a lot of the things for you. Um, you know, they're setting up mic stands, mics, drums. Really, you just rolled into the Cog Factories, you know, threw your shit on the stage. 
uh, and just played a show. You know, it was it was raw. It was raw, but you know, you learned a lot from the experience of it. To me, it's like now it's a, it's so long ago. It's a memory, but like those were like the most exciting times of my life, really. Because I think I started going there. I was about fourteen, and everything everything was new, and it was all an adventure. I don't know. It was just this fucking hole in the wall that you know became home pretty quickly it was our place i don't yeah. know it was just yeah. it, was, it was a it was a community the yeah Cog was a community sure. it was uh it was it was more than just like the four walls that were held together by dirt and grime it was uh all we had as far as a place to go you know there were record stores too but you know like that's just where we would go to to hang out and see people because we knew our friends were there. And you just wanted to be there. Like, your friends were always there. It was very organic, very basic. Everyone was sort of like this weird family. I think everybody cared so much because, like I said, it was family. It was like we all had to do our part to, to bring everything together. Mm-hmm. You know, we fought like family, but it was it was all worth it in the end. To me, it was, it was so interesting because it was like when you take... It's like everybody's like adults' nightmare. It's like taking all these kids that everyone's afraid of, or like they're not your stereotypical like jock or you know smart kid, and like putting them all in one place where you think there's going to be extreme chaos. Like they're going to lock them all in a cage and kill each other. But it was like the complete opposite. It was like for once they felt like they could just relax and be themselves and have a good time and. They all respected each other because of that. Place where you could go and like just a bunch of nerds were just like hanging out and uh, just you know being themselves, you know, and that's what uh, that's what was kind of great about it. You could just go there, uh, be yourself, and everyone loved you for that, you know. It was a place for people from all these different economic classes to kind of like it, you had the common goal of like music. You had the common goal of like this is what it's all about. We can all have, we can all gather here and have this cathartic experience together. I think a big reason why it was important was that anybody could play there. It wasn't, it wasn't ever a contest to like, do you bring in enough people to play there? Like we would go ahead and you could play there. Like anybody could play there. Um, it was totally egalitarian that way. It was a place for bands that weren't welcome anywhere else at the time, or didn't want to play anywhere else at the time. And it was the beginning stages of all the bands that you know became successful out of Omaha, or the bands that the successful bands modeled themselves after all came to the Cog Factory. The reason why it worked is because I wasn't there to promote what I liked at all. I mean, the only agenda was just to provide a place where everybody could do whatever they wanted and see whatever they wanted. Come to me with what you want to do, and I'll help you logistically. I and mean, people can think the place was dirty and it sucked and it sounded like shit, and that's fine. But like the reality of it is, knowing that you could go there and see any type of music, right? Um, it was really important to me. This isn't this isn't a punk club in the sense of punk music. This isn't a metal club. This isn't an acoustic club. This isn't an indie club. It's it's everything. If there, were, if there was a single place that spawned the rise of Omaha music, I think it was the Cog Factory. Because the people who ended up going to shows there grew up making bands that were made to play there and had a certain, there was a local camaraderie that um, was exemplified by the Cog Factory. It didn't feel like a competitive place, it felt like a, an expressive place. I believe that venues kind of dictate the the type of music that a band is going to make. You know, I feel like if you're a band, you have to envision what it is you're going to do, what you know, where you're going to perform, whether it's just in that room where you wrote the song or if it's in a basement or uh, at a club or at an outdoor event or at a church, all, you know, cathedral kind of space or all those I think change what type of the way that you think about your music and that changes the music itself. For us, the Cog Factory was like, it was where we imagined playing the music that we were making.
it wasn't, you know, obviously it wasn't the only place that we played, but that was, at least for me, the place that I imagined the songs being heard. I was drunk, I didn't let on. The important thing about the Cog Factory is that it was, you know, a place where people could see music and, and play music at any age, you know, and, and it was, gave people a sense of community. There's certain meeting places that you have to have. You, you know, every town needs to have a good record store and it needs to have a good club that has all ages shows, I think. The easiest way to put it is, is nothing lasts forever. Um, you know, it, it, nothing just, go, you know, nothing goes on for, forever, so everything has to end. I think I started in 92, I think, and then I left in the end of 98. I don't even know who was running it in the end, but I could only guess it's a major burden. To, to no discredit of the people that were pouring their lives for free into running that place, because believe me, I knew what they were doing and how hard it was to keep that thing going. But like, you cannot work five nights a week for free for years on end. You just can't do it. Not to get too cynical and like look back on it in a bad light, but you just didn't have that the, the dedication. People started to get busy with their lives, and and it was always a revolving door. But it's a real surprise that like how it stayed open. I think most importantly, the reason that the Cog Factory made it as long as it did is that this town was starving for it. Like everybody here needed something like that. And, you know, once they got it, we had to get as much out of it as we could. We had to squeeze that, that lemon every last drop. And then that was it. It was done. It crept in and it crept out and it was gone. To me, that's, I look back and I'm like, it's kind of a beautiful thing. The, the legacy I think it left was uh, just that, you know, and, and I think that this is, is deeper than just the cog factory and just this is part of being a, from this part of the country, just that, that can-do spirit uh, that people from Nebraska have, I think was, was very evident in, in what the cog factory stood for. And uh, no more different than than farmers, uh, you know, uh, all over the state of Nebraska, and yet here we're basically the, the, the offshoot of that, which were kids in Omaha, Nebraska, who had that same kind of mindset in what they wanted to do, and it came out with, with being a, a punk rock club. I, I think the legacy of it, it goes beyond um, just great memories of, of shows that you went to, but just that that uh, can-do spirit that, that carries you through life. It's not necessarily the cog that turned me into the person that I am, it's the people that I met there and solidified friendships there because they all understood whatever it is we all understand. I don't think you can really put it into words what was so great about that place. The real essence of the cog was just that you could tell when you walked in the door that everyone that was there was there for the same reason you were. It just literally captured what we all loved in a time in all of our lives that it meant the most. Cog Factory was in fact a lifeline for the kids that they used to shape themselves into decent adults. And so power to the music, power to the solidarity of innocent bonding. That's what I would say. Things were not necessarily innocent, but what brought us together, I think was innocent. I don't think I'd be where I am doing what I am doing today if it wasn't for the COG, you know, I mean, if it wasn't for being interested in going to see live music and seeing bands play and seeing them, you know, playing guitars and stuff like that, I don't think I'd be building guitars today if it wasn't for doing that stuff. It really got me into building and that's who I am today as a guitar builder. It helped carve who we all are. And I think that's why we love it so much. I know that for me, you know, kind of showed me how to be in society with not wanting to kill everyone. <laughs> I don't know 
if that experience even exists anymore. And I really do feel like we lost something. Every time I drive by that place, every time I look, and a million memories, I mean like a million memories flashed through my head. And there, there's like, it, it, my heart aches, <laughs> honestly. You know, just thinking about it because it was an amazing place and some of the most amazing bands I've ever seen played there. Like, I believe in the importance of music and ex expression and we brought something to Omaha that we didn't even know we were doing at the time. And I hope that the next generation of kids have some place to hear this stuff, to hear loud music, scary music, sad music, happy music, you know, insane music. I hope they have a place to do that and it's not just faceless bands on the internet. had bathrooms in quotations uh, <laughs> the bathrooms were probably the the most disgusting thing I've ever seen I would pee in the in the alley before I would pee in the bathroom if you were a religious person and you believed in hell that would probably be it if you could imagine like fire coming out of the toilet while you're sitting on it that's probably what would happen if you sat on the toilets there I mean the cleaning them consisted of You'd get like a bucket of water and dump some bleach in it and just throw it in there. And hopefully the smell would go away. <laughs> yes, we cleaned, believe it or not. Now, I have an aversion to feces. It is my kryptonite, you know, like, so I would dodge that duty whenever possible. But there were times when, oh my God, it, it's almost embarrassing. But I mean, at the same time, like we weren't making any fucking money. We didn't have a janitorial staff, you know, and... And it, we would put on the rubber gloves and go in there and cry a little bit, you know, like choke back like you know, the dry heaves and kind of scrub here and there. But we were doing our best, you know? And anybody who wants to bitch about it was more than welcome to come fucking clean uh -huh. anytime they wanted. And I would have let you into any show you wanted to get into, you know? The problem with the men's bathroom is that the roof leaked above the men's bathroom. And the landlord never would fix it. And it was just absolutely disgusting, which is why we never put a light in there, because then you couldn't see how disgusting it was. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, if I light this place, you know, people are going, yeah, you, you needed a tetanus shot before you went into that bathroom. If you went in there, you were just like, I'm going to catch something, and then they're not going to have any type of cure for it. And we had homeless people come in before and like be like, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to sit in there. You're like... You're like, you're homeless. What are you talking about? It's a bathroom. They're like, no, hell no. There was something. There was some glob of something either in the men's toilet or in the urinal that no one could figure out what it was and that everyone kind of had bets and it was kind of, it was taking on this mythology of what exactly it was, but nobody knew. And I still don't know what it was. 
the, the toilets had problems flushing, so they just, you know, poop or crap or whatever they do, and then just put more toilet paper on top, and it would get to where it's actually mounting up above the toilets, and we'd fix them so that they would work, and then people would just assume they didn't work, and so they wouldn't even try to flush them, and it would just pile up again, but we actually had to get salad tongs to dig toilet paper, feces, feminine hygiene products, and every other kind of disgusting filth out of the toilets. And as I reached in and pulled, you know, this wad of filth and vile, inhumane evil out of the toilet, roaches started coming up the pipe out and welling out of the bowl like something out of, you know, the omen or something like it was it was <laughs> horrific. I was afraid. I was disgusted. That's not what we were there for. We were there to watch the damn bands. You people showed up and shit and threw up all over the place, all right? That wasn't my fucking fault, okay? That's Omaha for you. <laughs>